Do you know what the three fruits of a healthy relationship are? Have you ever heard that your relationships can only be as healthy as you are as an individual? That's what we're talking about in today's episode of It Starts With Attraction. My name is Jason. I'm one of the producers of the podcast, and we're so excited that you've joined us for today's episode. This episode originally published on June 9th, 2020, and this is episode nine of It Starts With Attraction. And it's such a good episode that we decided we would run it again for those who maybe haven't heard it, or if you have heard it, this is great information to hear again. Kimberly is interviewing doctors Les and Leslie Parrott. Les and Leslie are a husband and wife team who not only share the same name, but the same passion for helping others build healthy relationships. Les is a professor of psychology at Northwest University, and they are founders of the Center for Healthy Relationships on the campus of Olivet University. Their professional training, Leslie as a marriage and family therapist, and Les as a clinical psychologist, ensures a presentation that is grounded, insightful, and cutting edge. The parrots have been featured in USA Today and the New York Times. And their television appearances include CNN, The View, The O'Reilly Factor, The Today Show, and Oprah. As number one New York Times best-selling authors, their books have sold over two million copies in more than two dozen languages. And without further ado, here is Three Fruits of a Healthy Relationship with Drs. Les and Leslie Parrott. Let's dive in. joined today by Drs. Les and Leslie Parrott, and so excited for both of you to be on the show. Thank you so much for taking the time and energy. I know that you have a ton going on. We're really excited to have this conversation with y'all. It's our pleasure, and uh, we're excited to have this great conversation with you. Thanks, Kimberly. It's good to be with you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you both have just spent years focusing on helping relationships, helping marriages. You definitely have a heart and a passion for what you do and have just made an amazing impact. And you haven't stopped. You continue to go on. And recently, y'all have written a another book to just add to your repertoire. And this one is all about the, it's called Healthy Me, Healthy Us. So can you explain just to our audience, to me, what led to you wanting to write this book, adding it on to all of the other great things that you have done? And where did the idea for it come from? Yeah, Healthy Me, Healthy Us. And uh, I'll tell you, we've written a lot of books on relationships and marriage and, you know, saving your marriage before it starts and love talk and crazy good sex and, and, um, you know, bad things happen to good marriage. All these marriage books that we've done over the years, uh, we really feel like this one is the hub of the wheel in so many ways because it's all about you. This is the premise of the whole book. Your relationships, whether it's marriage or friendship or anything else, your relationships can only be as healthy as you are. Therefore, one of the most important things you'll ever do for your relationships or for your marriage is to work on who you are in the context of those relationships. So this is a book that uh, has, it's not just a, a book we sat down and went, uh, hey, what haven't we read about or written about? You know, let's, let's think up of a, a book idea. This is a book that has been germane to our message for decades, for at least the last 20 years, as we've talked about relationships. Because, I'll say it again, your relationships can only be as healthy as you are. Yeah, that's right. It's really, so as Les said, this isn't just a new insight. This is absolutely the bedrock, sort of the core of our calling to help people with healthy relationships. Just that deep understanding that the best gift I can give my relationships is to work on who I am in the context of them. Have you seen this becoming more of a problem with people over the past decade with how busy life has gotten with, you know, social media, cell phones. Do you feel like it's become more of a message that people need to hear or has it always been there and people have been using things to, to get lost in themselves and, and not focus on themselves? What have y'all seen with that? I don't, I don't think there's a real correlation. I think it's germane to just uh, human nature. Uh, we often look to somebody else to kind of be a shortcut to our personal wholeness to our personal well-being uh, long before we had the kind of technology we have today. I don't think that, that uh, it, it may be a benefit actually to it. But uh, um, he, in fact, let me tell you a quick story of how this this whole thing kind of uh, originated 
at the very front end. Leslie and I were teaching at a university here in Seattle where we live, uh, and we had, you know, this in kind of epiphany um, one evening when we had a bunch of students that showed up for a little talk. Uh, in fact, these students are, are invited us. They said, would you come give a talk in our residence hall? Uh, and they said the talk will be entitled How to Fall in Love Without Losing Your Mind. That was the title <laughs> they gave us. And uh, so we showed up to this um, residence hall. I think it was around 10 o'clock on a, like a Wednesday. It was just a, you know, a weeknight, nothing terribly special, didn't get a lot of publicity. But when and, and they said you can expect about 25 students to show up for this thing on the hall. And uh, it was around Valentine's Day. But when we walked over there, uh, 10 o'clock in the evening, there's this long line of students that were, you know, lined up to get into this residence hall. We're wondering, what's going on here? Well, it turned out they came for this talk. And it wasn't because of us. We were brand new to the campus. We hadn't written a single book at that point. And like I said, this was more than, what, 25 years yes. ago, something like that. And um, so we showed up. And it was such a, a, you know, pivotal kind of turning point for us. We walked out of that thinking these students are starving for information on healthy relationships. And, and then it was that spring we said, let's do an event for engaged couples and we'll call it Saving Your Marriage Before It Starts. And again, we were overwhelmed by the response to that. Eventually, um, you know, wrote the book by that mm-hmm. same title and then ended up doing all kinds of media, including Barbara Walters and Oprah Winfrey and all the rest. And, and it was just like, wow, we have this suddenly have this megaphone to talk about relationships. And um, and then we thought the next fall, we should offer a course for these students on our, our college campus. This is a small private school, about 6,000 students. And uh, we thought, you know, we teach these students everything in the world. If you want to learn about accounting, we have classes mm-hmm. on that. we got classes on that. But we don't have classes on relationships. And so we thought, mm-hmm. why not start a class? We'll call it Relationships 101. And if you know anything about academic settings, you know, you can't just dream up a class and start teaching it. You get it approved by the provost and the dean and all that kind of stuff. And so remember, we put that proposal together. Right. And it had, uh, what were some of the topics we wanted to give in that? Yeah, we wanted to help students understand, first of all, that their family is formative in their relationships. Mm -hmm. relationship they build is based on the lessons they learned in their family origin. Yeah, your your family ties. You learn so much in that school. It's like your university of relationships is the home you grew up in. We want to talk about friendship and the difference between friends of the heart and friends of the road. And we want to talk about what do you do when your friends fail you? If that mm-hmm. hasn't happened to you yet, put your seatbelt on because it's coming. We all have our own private Gethsemane. We all have our own Judas. And we wonder, why wow, I, I trusted him with my money. I trusted her with my secrets or what have you. And so All these topics, sexuality, um, relating to God without feeling phony. um, Even even breaking up and staying in one piece. Yeah, how to break up and (laughs) stay in one piece. What do you do if you're the heartbreaker? What if you're the brokenhearted and you're in a dating relationship? Anything that was relevant to these students in relationships, we thought we'll put in this little uh, proposal. We brought it to the committee and got turned down. And they said it wasn't academic enough and, and there's no textbooks for it. And we said, we'll write our own. And, you know, and this went on for the better part of a year. And finally, after the third meeting with this committee uh, to kind of get it greenlit, um, they said, OK, we'll let you teach the class. But they listed out all these conditions. It'll need to be pass failed and it'll be general elective. Uh, you're not going to get compensated. You'll teach it on as an overload, all these things. And so we finally got a room. I think it was Monday nights at 6 p.m., right? Yeah, not not the ideal slot for a course. <laughs> not for an undergraduate campus. And, uh, but there was 12 chairs in the room, and we thought, hey, you know, even if we can get 12 students to show up for a pass-fail course. Well, it was about three hours into the first day of registration, and the registrar called our office, said, hey, uh, Doc, he said, we're going to have to move your classroom. And I said, oh, why, you need the space for something else? He said, no. He said, we realized we had 250 students sign up in the last three hours. Oh, and, wow. And uh, he said, the only place on the campus that will ha- accommodate you is the auditorium. He said, so we moved you into the auditorium. But he said, you didn't limit the number of students that could take the class. So there's no, uh, you know, it just keeps building up. There's a huge waiting list to get in even now that you're in the auditorium. So that was the very first time we offered this course, Relationships 101. And we taught that course for 20 years, um, every Monday night, 6 p.m., still pass-fail, no compensation. But we love teaching that. 
And I tell you all this to let you know, on the very first night of that course, we tell the students, it doesn't matter whether you take any notes, there's, it's a pass-fail course, there's no midterm, there's no final, there's no pop quiz. You're going to get out of this experience, whatever it is that you'd like to get out of it. But we want you to write down at least one single sentence. And we tell them this single sentence has the potential to revolutionize any relationship you ever attempt to build. And they all get out their pencils or, or their keyboards and they get ready to take this down. And we put it up on this huge screen in the auditorium. And here's the sentence. And, and this is the seedling that we planted, by the way, for this book that we're talking about. But here's the sentence that we say can revolutionize any relationship. If you try to build intimacy with another person before you've done the difficult work of getting whole or healthy on your own, all your relationships become an attempt to complete yourself mm -hmm. and they'll fall flat. Guaranteed. Let me say it again. If you try to build a connection, if you try to build a relationship, if you try to build intimacy with another person before you've done the difficult task of getting healthy, of getting whole on your own, all your relationships become an attempt to complete yourself and they'll fall flat. Why? Because nobody's designed to complete you. And we fall victim to, you know, fairy tales and movies and books and, mm -hmm. and things that tell us we're going to find our soulmate and they're going to be that shortcut to what we're looking for. And of course, nobody can do that. Yeah. And that doesn't stop us from having that, that deep longing for belonging. And most of us, that compulsion for completion, because we already know that we're not at the finish line when it comes to our journey toward health and wholeness. We know that. Right. And so that's why after all these years uh, of preaching this message, we thought, well, we need to put our money where our mouth is and give people a roadmap on how to get healthy. This is this book, Healthy Me, Healthy Us, is not a marriage book. It's not really even a relationship book. It's a guidebook to help you on your journey to get healthy and to get whole. Why? I'm going to say it again, because your relationships can only be as healthy as you are. Does that make sense? Oh, it makes total sense. So one of the things I noticed is if you if you go to the website for the book, healthymehealthyus.com, one of the first things that encourages you to start doing is to take a negative self-talk assessment. So is this where you start with people? Do you have them start by identifying the ways that they are speaking to themselves, the things they're doing that are terrible habits or, or, you know, that lead to the negative self-esteem that I might, that they might have. Is that where you start? Well, the book has three sections, three kind of things we want to help people get a lock on. And each of those three sections has two chapters in it. And so the very first section is what we call profound significance. If you want to get healthy, you got to get a lock on how profoundly significant you are in the eyes of God. God loves you as if you're the only person on the planet to love, as St. Augustine said. And so this is kind of what, this is where we get grounded. This is the foundation for personal well-being and health. And obviously we're coming at this from as people of faith and uh, with a, a Christian perspective. And so that's where we begin. Um, and so to do that, to get practical, and people that have gone to church for years have maybe heard this message, you know, and we've sung the Jesus loves me, this I know, and, and all the other songs, and, and we sing as adults about God's amazing grace and so forth. But to really experience that deep down in your bones where it's revolutionary, where it is something that is, is felt deeply, not just, you know, a cognitive exercise, um, but it's something that we live out. You, you've got to get super practical. As we like to say, you've got to put the cookies on the bottom shelf. And so one of the ways to do that is to focus on your self-talk. And that's why we have this self-test. Uh, and, and you can find that at healthymehealthyus.com. And uh, healthymehealthyus.com. And you can take this little free assessment. And um, you said a negative self-talk assessment. It's not necessarily negative. We have positive self-talk, too. And this is just like a little mirror, right, to help you get a little glimpse into what you're saying to yourself. Because right. it's the single most important conversation you have all day long. Right. And you're happy. 
24 7. It even happens while you sleep. It happens in your dreams. And it's very formative. We do know from research that people tend toward the negative self talk. But this assessment really helps you get a lock on what your personal experience is with that. And so often the messages that we're telling ourselves about ourselves, and nobody else hears, but they shape our distancing ourselves from that profound significance, which is fundamental to every healthy person. Imagine if you could, before you fell asleep tonight, you could pull a little uh, chip out of the back of your head and it would have recorded all of your self-talk for the last yeah. 24 hours. And you could plug it into your laptop and it would tabulate that. <laughs> and it would put it into one of two categories, either positive self-talk or negative self-talk. And what you would discover, if you're like most people, about 73% of your self-talk would go into the negative bucket. We know this from research at UCLA. And uh, that's for people that are functioning, high, you know, high functioning people. We all have these internal tapes, these recordings of self-talk. They often come from our family of origin, but they can come from anywhere. Um, literally, before we got on to this, uh, this interview with you, we were crafting a response to a woman that had just emailed us uh, that is about to be married. And her, her fiancé was giving her just terrible body shaming messages mm. that tap right grew up with. And so we're, we're all victims of this, whether we want to be or not. And so that's where we start. And that's why we want to give away this free assessment. Mm-hmm. And it's super fun. You can do this in less than, really less than about five minutes. Just go to healthyme, uh, healthyus.com and take the little assessment. And it's a really, it's a nice starting place. It's a place to kind of on-ramp to this whole idea of how do I get healthy so that my relationships can be healthier too. Mm -hmm. I would rather have one of those chips preloaded with the positive thoughts that I could just put in every morning and have the good thoughts all day long. Well, and and that's really what the book is about. (laughs) That that book is is the closest I think that we'll get, at least in our lifetime, to a chip you can put in your head that will help you (laughs) reprogram some of that software so that you're actually saying things to yourself. That, that are healthier. That are healthy, but not just that are that are kind and gentle, but that are profoundly true because they're based mm-hmm. on on really what we know to be mm-hmm. what our profound significance is based on. And that's who we are in the eyes of God. And that mm-hmm. is an unchangeable thing. You know, it's something we receive. We don't achieve it. We don't achieve it by being perfect or whole or anything else. We receive it as pure gift and it cannot be changed. But it is so hard to break that mindset. It is because Mm -hmm. it's been around forever. Like I said, it's the single most important conversation that you have all day long. You had it yesterday. You're going to have it tomorrow. You had it before you were listening to us in this interview. And you're going to have it after this. And you're having it during this interview. (laughs) And uh, some people that are listening to us are right now saying to themselves, even in a a more subconscious Mm -hmm. level, they're saying, well, I can't change that. They don't understand me, the kind of home mm-hmm. I grew up in, my life experiences. Sure. My story. And we fall victim to what Martin Sullivan called learned helplessness. And mm-hmm. we give up before we even start. And the research shows, no, anybody and everybody can begin to create an, an internal dialogue that is very different, that can be revolutionary. And so that's why, in fact, we, we start the whole book with, uh, you know, um, uh, what we call a, a deep and simple plan. And yeah, we, we all uh, have celebrated uh, Mr. Rogers recently. There have been a good documentary and a movie about him, and we're reminded of him actually every time we have a big crisis because he says so many sweet things like, look for the helpers. But mm-hmm. another thing Fred Rogers reminded us of is that life is deep and simple, and we often try to make it complicated and shallow. Yeah. And so I don't want people that are listening to us think, oh, this is like two psychologists and they're going to give us a bunch of psychobabble in this book and it's going to be yeah. difficult to wrap our heads around. No, like I said, cookies on the bottom shelf. Three things we want to help you get a lock on. And the first is profound significance. And one of the ways of doing that is to tune into your self-talk and understand that. You know, we psychologists often say awareness is curative. And it's so true. It really is. You can't change much until you become aware of it in yourself. And so that's what self-talk is all about. Becoming aware of your self-talk is sometimes almost enough to change it and transform it right there and then. Mm -hmm. 
It's, it's so true and it's so good, but I think people gloss over that so quickly because they think either it's too easy or it's too simple. You know, they think that they have to do something crazy. I know I did that. I thought, well, if I, I have to do something big, if I want to change my thoughts, you know, go to a counselor or a psychologist, which aren't bad things, but there's more that we probably have control over in our minds and our thoughts. And we think we do. I was in, I was encouraged to write down throughout a day, the list of things that I think about myself. And then as, um, as Leslie was saying, replace that with, with something that is true, but something that is positive. And I thought that's so cheesy, but I did it. And it was amazing how, when I kept looking at those things day after day, um, like one of the things I wrote is I'm a working mom. And so I, there are definitely times where I feel that guilt and shame of I'm not a good mom. I'm not there as much as other moms are for their kids. And so I wrote down that negative thought of I'm not a good mom. And I replaced it with I'm a caring mom. And when I am there, I am present. And I just put it on my fridge. And after looking at it for a month, I started to believe it. And it changed because it was true. What I replaced it with was true. It wasn't, I'm an awesome mom, because I didn't believe that necessarily was true, but it was something that I believed was true. I love that. That is a shining example of exactly what we're talking about, because you you then just received the fact that, yeah, I'm fully present with my kids when I'm there. And every work, working mom, and I'm in that category as well, has guilt no matter which side of that equation we're on at the time. So that that is life changing, that simple but deep exercise. And that is exactly the kind of roadmap we're hoping to give people. Mm-hmm. So where, where do people go from there? Where do you guide them to next? So we start with profound significance, as I said. This is the three-part plan. Um, Just to give all three of them, it's profound significance. It's unswerving authenticity. That has to do with being true to you because so many of us fall victim to that disease to please, right? It's one of the marks of of folks that um, just get stuck in a rut and and are never really achieving what they were put on this planet to do. Yeah. Yeah. and so we, we do what we think we're supposed to do because, well, that's what mom and dad said I should do, or because we're trying to win this person's approval or get this person's blessing or uh, whatever. And we really know God has called us to follow this path going this direction, but well, everybody else seems to think I should go down this path. And so that disease to please can be really detrimental on your path to, to getting healthy and whole. So unswerving authenticity is all about that. It's facing your fears with honesty. Um, It's making sure you have that kind of path to go on. So profound significance, unswerving authenticity. So, and if you think about it, profound significance has to do with your relationship with with God. Mm -hmm. And unswerving authenticity has to do with your relationship with you, right? It's being true to you. Mm -hmm. And then the third one we say to get a lock on is self-giving love. And this is where we begin to transcend our own boundaries, recognize other people's needs that are unique from our own. And that's where we really begin to blossom. That's where life really begins to get exciting. Um, And you love the life you live because now it's not about you. You know, I often talk about this idea of, of putting mirrored sunglasses on and flipping around the lenses and looking out the world. And all you see is a reflection of your own needs. And that's appropriate to do when you're like 14 years old and your task is to carve out your identity uh, because you're obsessed with the question, how am I doing? What do people think of me? Who am I? That's the developmental task you need to be accomplishing. But as you mature and you grow beyond that, you should be able to walk, walk into a room and no longer say, hey, how am I doing? What do people think of me? But how are you doing? All right. And, and that's that self-giving love. And so the third step in this whole process is is getting to that point. That's why the book is called Healthy Me, Mm -hmm. Healthy Us, because it's eventually about us, whether that's a friendship or marriage or your work relationships or even total strangers. Mm -hmm. And so that self-giving love, we in there, we we have a couple chapters, one about reading your social barometer, and then the other is in the concluding chapter of the book is on stepping into another person's shoes. 
all about empathy. I wish that we could bottle empathy. I wish we could package it. I wish we, everybody that's listening into this interview, we could say, hey, go to Healthy Me, Healthy Us, and get your free bottle of empathy. It's a spray bottle. And the next time you're in a conversation with somebody, just spray that conversation with empathy. It would mm-hmm. transform everything for you because empathy is its the single most important skill set we bring to any relationship. The capacity to accurately see the world from somebody else's perspective. And uh, that's that's not easy to do. Most of us think we do it better than we actually do. And so anyway, we conclude the book with some really practical steps on, on how to make that a reality. But profound significance, unswerving authenticity and self-giving love. You get a lock on those three things and you will recognize that you're entering your relationships with a whole new level of wholeness and health. Mm-hmm. And by the way, before I even forget, I need to say this. This is not a task that you check off your to-do list. Mm-hmm. This is not something that you're going to wake up someday and go, hey, I guess this is the day I'm completely whole. I'm completely healthy. You know, we're always in process. Mm-hmm. And so none of us arrive. It's a continuum. And so we're trying to get that reader through this book further down the continuum to be able to have those kinds of relationships because they're healthy themselves. But even though it's not some place we arrive at and cross off with perfection, it is a synergistic experience because uh, every every step you take forward in that sense of profound significance and you know in an authenticity leads you deeper into self giving love and it's synergy. So that you're getting ever closer to, you know, life is getting deeper and deeper and more and more simple as you grow in those ways. And don't you think that when you start doing this and you embody it, that the people you're in relationships with see the change and it encourages them to want to either know what what you did, want to do it, or at least to just work on themselves to be better? I think that is, I'm so grateful you brought that up because one of the most powerful things about working on who you are in the context of your relationship is how contagious that actually is. Mm. Because when you offer a relationship from a place of health, um, just by God's design, we're all created with something called mirror neurons. And if we offer, uh, you know, self-giving love, it is nearly impossible for the person we're offering that to not to be drawn to offer right back because mm-hmm. we, you know, just like we can't flash a smile or erupt in laughter without it being contagious, love is like that and awareness is like that. Every healthy thing we do raises the tide for everyone in our relationship. So it is the most it is the most contagious gift you could give. You're not working on just getting you healthy mm-hmm. and the relationship stays the same you get healthy and it brings the relationship up with you it's a very powerful experience and what a generous gift to offer Mm -hmm. what are the biggest excuses that y'all hear from people of why they can't do this well most people aren't even thinking about it it's not like uh, oh, I, I can't get healthy because X, Y, Z. They don't, it's not even top of mind, right? Mm-hmm. All they're thinking is, I keep having this communication meltdown in my marriage, or mm-hmm. I can't seem to find the right person. Do I have like this thing on my forehead that says I'm attracted to, to idiots or, or what? <laughs> and, and so it's, it's, they don't, they, the, the frame has to shift. Mm-hmm. And it's not about finding the right person. It's about becoming the right person. Mm-hmm. It's not about the techniques and tips in your marriage. It's mm-hmm. about who you are, not just what you do. And so, yeah, we're all, we've written books and workbooks all over the place on, on techniques and tips. Those, those are valuable. But if you're trying to do that from a platform where it's not healthy, those mm-hmm. tips and techniques become little swords. They become little weapons. And to weaponize a technique that can be helpful in a marriage or a relationship for communication obviously serves the wrong purpose. Because then all you're wanting to say is, well, I'm doing the right thing and you don't even know how to do this. And that's why this relationship is terrible and blah, blah, blah. You know, it begins with you. Who you are is more important than what you do. Because when those things, when the tips and techniques and strategies are all flowing out of a healthy place in your life, that's when they're transformative. That's when you can really hold on to something. Make sense? Oh, absolutely. It's it's similar to thinking about the symptoms of a 
a virus or a disease versus finding the root cause. We see the symptoms in our relationships. And that's what we try and fix with the medicine or the Band-Aid. But until we get to that cause of it, it's not going to fix the symptoms. We have to get to that root, like y'all are talking about in this book, starting with us, believing the good things that God says about us, listening to his call on our lives, doing that outward, and then and then connecting with people from there. I think it's beautiful. And I am so excited that y'all have written this book, that you are putting this message out there because people absolutely need to hear it. Yeah, I appreciate that. And that's why we say it's a deep and simple plan. It's not mm-hmm. it's not easy like you just wake up and, oh, I read the book right. and so now I'm good. <laughs> um, this is something we continually work on. And that's why we give so many strategies that are practical, beginning with that self-test to help you understand the single most important conversation that you're having right now. And that's the conversation that you have with you. And so once more, people can find that for free at healthy me, healthy us.com. That's so good. Well, what else can we point our audience to? You do so much with marriages. Where can people follow the two of you uh, apart from this book? They get the book. That's great, but they want to connect with you even deeper. Where else can they do that? Sure. Well, folks can find out all kinds of stuff about us at, at lessonlesley.com. We have the same name. It's very confusing. <laughs> I'm Leslie. She's Leslie. We spell it the exact same way. So um, it's even more complicated because I'm the third. My dad's name is Leslie. My grandfather's <laughs> name is Leslie. <laughs> I love I'm it. Leslie. And then I married Leslie. And that's why we named our first son, John. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, folks can just go to uh, lessonlesley.com and uh, We have uh, all of our resources there, all of our books, Saving Your Marriage Before It Starts. We have some assessments. In fact, this book, Healthy Me, Healthy Us, has a deeper assessment. We call it YADA, Y-A-D-A, the YADA assessment um, that people can take as well. And that goes even deeper than the free self-talk assessment Mm -hmm. uh, that you can find right now online. But uh, anyway, that assessment, there's links there for that, as well as uh, Better Love, which is a great tool. You know, during the midst of the coronavirus, we've discovered that so many couples are creating their own date nights at mm-hmm. home because we can't go out to the restaurants we love and, and all that. And mm-hmm. so uh, this, this little uh, assessment, you go online, answer a few questions, takes about 10 minutes, and it generates this 10-page report on your relationship. And I know as soon as I say report on your relationship, couples that are listening to us right now are going, Yikes. that's the last <laughs> thing I want is a report on my relationship. We don't, it's not that kind of report. It doesn't evaluate. It doesn't grade. You don't pass or fail it. It's really a roadmap, just like this book uh, for enjoying lifelong love. And so anyway, all that is right there at lessonlessly.com. And uh, thanks for asking about that. We also have all our speaking engagements there. Of course, we're in a holding pattern. Uh, We speak to lots of, uh, especially churches around the country and do an event called Fight Night. It's all about uh, conflict. And uh, uh, we often say conflict is the price you pay for a deeper level of intimacy. If you know how to fight a good fight, it can bring you closer together. And so once we're free to uh, begin rescheduling these uh, events, we'll be back out on the road and our schedule will be there at lessonlesley.com as well. I am definitely going to do the better love assessment. Just last night, I said to my husband, we need to just still have date night. It's a little more difficult because we have a five and three-year-old and of course, no grandparents to be able to take them to right now. But we have got to, I said, let's just put him to bed at six o'clock and then we will do something like play a board game, you know, make dinner together and... And just connect because it is difficult, but so needed to do. No, I love hearing that. That's uh, like I said, we've had, I suppose, tens of thousands of couples doing this over this, uh, this time when we're all cooped up. And, mm-hmm. and so that's, that's called better love, better, better love. love.com. They can go to, to find that. And one of the cool things it does, you know, we were talking about empathy as it relates to, I'm holding the report here in my hand. And as it relates to Healthy Me, Healthy Us, the book, um, is it uh, gives you a perspective on your hardwire and your two personalities and where you kind of stand in relationship to each other, just in your hardwiring. 
And that's a great on-ramp to empathy, you know, which is a, a task that is, is vital to emotional well-being and health. And so anyway, it gets into that and it gets into communication, managing conflict, sexual intimacy, uh, even how we experience time, uh, yeah, money, all those things. Every, like, like everything else. I mean, this might even be in your request for a date. We don't experience time the same way. We, you know, some of us are spontaneous. Some of us are very scheduled. So even getting together, even when we're in quarantine together, we're not always in sync when it comes to how we want to connect, even for a date night, just at home. But it is a fun thing you can do. It comes with a a little action plan that literally gives you four date nights you can experience and unpack a couple of those pages and fun activities to do and that kind of thing. So, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you caught the vision for that. Oh, absolutely. I it's so important. And especially when you are in an industry like the two of you are, where you're dealing with marriage stuff on an ongoing basis. I don't know how it's been for the two of you over the past. How many years have you been married now? 35 years for us. That's amazing. Congratulations. (laughs) We're coming up on 10. So we're, and that's amazing too, actually a decade is an achievement. (laughs) <laughs> yes. It, yes. When we get to the point where he's been in my life longer than he hasn't, that's going to be, that's, that will be our next craziness. But, but for us, at least for me, um, because in my day job, it's, you know, I, I run an organization that works with marriages, many of which are in crisis. And so it can, I can get in that mindset of over analyzing my own marriage because I know what I don't want my marriage to turn into. And I know what research says are the healthiest things to do in a relationship, right? Like I know all of these things, um, but I don't get it perfect all the time. And it, and it can be hard to, to just take a step back and be a wife and not be an analyzer all of the time. So we need that even more. My husband and I, just so we can be a couple and connect and not be me evaluating our marriage all the time. I love your authenticity about that. And of course, Les and I are the same way people think, well, you know, you teach on marriage and you're a psychologist and a marriage and family therapist, so it must be perfect. And we just laugh and say, absolutely not. And if anyone has ever heard our teaching, it, our, our story is front and center because every single tool we've created is for us. We have put them into practice just like every other couple. So we're, we're pilgrims on this marriage journey. And sharing it with others. But you're taking that and creating it and using these tools to just help other people, which is amazing and wonderful. Well, thank you so much. It's been so fun to be on your uh, interview here. And yeah. I know you're just launching this podcast and, and what an honor to be a part of that launch with you. Yeah. Well, thank both of you so much for your time, for everything you've done for the past, you know, 35 years of what your marriage has stood for and how you've impacted others. Thank you for your dedication to it. Absolutely. It's been an honor to be with you. Thanks so much. Here are my key pies takeaways from today's episode and interview with Les and Leslie. It's really pretty simple. You guys, you have got to to work on yourself before you work on your relationships. Because if you let your relationships become the thing that you are measuring yourself against, the thing that you are totally focused on, the thing that you're trying to complete yourself with, then it's never going to work. Come at becoming the most attractive that you can be from a place of starting with yourself not to do it for someone else or to get a relationship or to get someone to become attracted to you again. Do it because it's the best thing to do for you. Do the self-assessment that Dr. Les and Dr. Leslie talked about in the interview so that you can really start thinking about what you're saying to yourself. For me, it was a game changer when they talked about if you had a chip in your brain that you were to take out at the end of the day and then put it into into your computer and see the things you say to yourself, what would you see? When I visualized it like that, it made me start changing, even in that moment, the things that I was saying to myself. Do the work, start with yourself, and from there, you will have healthy relationships. 
Hey, thanks so much for listening to today's episode. If you enjoyed the episode, please consider subscribing so that you never miss an episode and also consider leaving a review. If you haven't already, please check out the show notes for all of the links for Drs. Les and Leslie Parrott. We'll be back with a new episode next week. And until then, stay strong.